this, this week I'm very excited. Uh, this week we have the co-founder of Two People USA and Mobile Guys. So please we give a warm welcome to Andrew Chow. Uh, so thanks for having me. Uh, I am super excited. For those who don't know, I don't. Do you guys get my bio or anything for this? I don't. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm like a two-time alum. So I loved it so much the first time that I came back uh, for second. <laughs> Uh, which is not really good considering that it's all in the public school basket. And, uh, given public school situation, we'll see. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you guys about today was entrepreneurship. And I hear you guys want to talk about failure. Is that like really the theme of the... the, the There's a, yeah, I'm losing. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to try to talk about failure and incorporate that through the talk. Although I'm going to be really honest and you're seeing me at the end. I'm not a fan of the word. A lot of people aren't a fan of the word, so I'm actually going to go a little bit more into a separate topic, and you'll see what I mean later. But um, I want to thank you guys for having me. I remember um, being here. Uh, I was a Haas MBA also. So I was undergrad uh, Haas 04, and then a Haas 11. And so I spent a lot of time down here, and I know what it's like, especially at this time of day. So I'm going to try to keep it entertaining. Um, I want to. Uh, be really honest, I drop a lot of F-bombs and a lot of corny and uh, provocative jokes, so I apologize in advance if you're kind of um, a little sensitive to that. So, is this being recorded, by the way? No, right? It is, but we don't have to publish it. No, okay. Where's the camera? Oh, right there. I'll keep it a little more PC then. So, <laughs> so um, for those who don't know what Boba is, or for those who don't know what uh, the company I founded is, how many people have heard of Boba Guys? Like, that's half of them usually. Okay, so thanks. Um, so what we're known for, uh, and this is uh, the only time I get to quote Vogue uh, magazine, and it's my favorite quote, it's uh, Chow, that's me, and my friend, uh, Bin Chen, were credited with jumpstarting the better Boba trend. Um, that's kind of sweeping across the country. We started about 2011. We got the idea in 2010 when I was here and through my MBA, and I mentioned that I got my finished it in 2011. And I, my co-founder and I never thought it would get this far. But for those who don't know, we started out as a pop-up. Um, if you don't know what pop-up means, it means it's just like a really fancy lemonade stand in somebody else's real piece of real estate. So what um, I wanted to do is set a little bit of context I know it's really self-indulgent to do these kind of things. Again, I've been in your guys' shoes and you're like, who is this guy? He's not really a cool VC founder or anything like that. But at the end of the day, uh, I uh, was kind of a, both a suit and then an hour entrepreneur. So I was a corporate um, hat for a really long time. After grad school, uh, I was a brand manager at Clorox. So if anybody is into marketing, I spent a lot of time doing brand management. And I was, I was pretty good at that. And I, I really thought I was going to run like, GM of Pepsi or Coca-Cola. And then uh, I eventually figured out that I kind of like doing my own thing. I think Haas is the defining principle of question the status quo, really stuck with me. And so, um, and then the dean didn't pay me to say that. But uh, I really thought, hey, I might want to do something on my own. And so we founded in 2011, and uh, we did it actually as a part-time thing for about three and a half years. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And it, about kind of my approach to entrepreneurship, which is not really that much of a brave approach. I think a lot of entrepreneurs get too much credit for being like really ballsy. Uh, I don't think I'm that. I really, I'm not trying to humble brag or be um, really about false humility. I, you could t you'll see from my profile that I was always, maybe like you guys in this room, a little more conservative. It's why I went to a good school. It's why I got my MBA. And eventually, uh, I almost threw it all away. Um, and so I'll kind of walk through the mentality of what I think it takes to be uh, an entrepreneur. We have about 10 stores right now. Uh, we have 10 stores or more right now. We're about to open one in about a couple weeks. We'll have, a, uh, I think, 17 this year. Actually, I'm not even supposed to say that, but we have two people from our team here. Um, Jesse, who are currently works for me, and Benj, who is an alumni. He's, at a, he's Haas right now. So, um, so they kind of know the inside secret. But we're about to open in LA, and if you haven't visited our stores, please come. It does not look like a normal Vogue shop. For those who actually know anything about Vogue guys, we're kind of, it's why we're in Vogue. We probably were the first true Vogue shop, if anything, to ever like cross over. Like it's where we get all the influencers and celebrities and athletes who come. So um, we're super happy to do that. 
And so if you also don't know, uh, a lot of the context is we never took funding. And I'm going to talk about one of the kind of failures that I did, which was uh, we took a friends and family loan, but uh, bootstrapped, if you kind of do a back on envelope valuation, we're about a $50 million company owned by two, two, two kids. And that's, uh, I hear, uh, that's rare. It's never been done uh, in probably the last four decades. So uh, you look at Phil's, Sweet Greens, every other food company, they've all been uh, venture backed. We're not. So, uh, Tasting Table says we start a revolution, more self indulgent stuff, and then we're just bringing things to foodie Americans. So here we go. First lesson, uh, this is the first quote that is on the front page of Vogue, and I didn't actually, I kind of just said it offhand, and I don't really have a filter, and I learned my lesson. And uh, it really is true, if you know anything about Taiwanese slang, it does mean boobs. My mom asked me why, and I honestly didn't know. And it was kind of embarrassing, but it was too late to change it because we had our logo and everything incorporated. So um, the lesson, I guess, over time is when you're an entrepreneur, you're going to be winging it a lot. You're going to have a lot of moments where you just don't know what the hell you're doing, and you end up um, getting really weird comments like this. So my friends make fun of this. They call me boob guys all the time. Um, so the talk is really about four keys to entrepreneurship. And I've done this several times um, at many different business schools. And I kind of change it based on which school, because I know this is my alma mater, that you guys are more principled compared to a Wharton or a Kellogg, uh, I would hope, because there are actually four defined principles where other schools have really none. And uh, I, I would say that when I think about entrepreneurship, how many people think about, are thinking about being an entrepreneur here? You've been thinking about it. Is there, this why you guys are taking the class? Just shout out what industries you think you're going to be in. Toothpaste. Tooth really? You got a good smile. Jordan, I know Jordan from way back too. All right. Toothpaste. <laughs> what else? Politics. Politics. Entrepreneur in politics. Interesting. Food. We need better voting machines. Yeah. Uh, what else? Food. 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 Okay. Um, tech, of course. This is, this is Haas, of course. So a lot of entrepreneurs... I think um, still get bucketed, no matter whether it's politics even, or toothpaste, the idea of entrepreneurship I think has four really core keys to making something run. So I call these four things. In any interview I do, in any talk I do, I almost always go back to these four, I would say defining principles, but these four keys that unlock everything. One is the startup mentality, um, and I'll explain each of these in depth. Second is passion. Third is people, and the fourth is luck. And you're gonna need a lot of it. But I think uh, I'll have my different interpretation of what luck means to me um, as we go. So the, the first one is the startup mentality. So uh, I like to do this thing where you're taught one truth, but I try to debunk them. And so it's like myth busting. And so I'm gonna do this throughout the talk. The first thing, when I was in your guys' seats, I used to think, I don't know, when I was 20 years old, I was like, wow, entrepreneurs must be really like, man, they're badass. They're like punk rock. They, they're anti-establishment. They do whatever the fuck they want. And they, first that's fun. Um, and, you know, there, it was before Zuckerberg, right? I was undergrad of four. So when I was your guys' age, uh, it was right before Facebook took off. I remember actually being one of the first people on Facebook. And I was like, nobody's here. You know, it was like, it was like you know, six schools on Facebook. And, Haas, Berkeley was like the sixth one, I think. And um, I thought it was, you know, really about risk. And I actually don't agree with that. And if you guys are reading a lot of the latest studies on entrepreneurs and what makes somebody an entrepreneur, you'll see that most people are saying it is exactly the opposite. So the, the fact that I agree with, and this is from a book that I'm going to go into called The Originals. If you guys, have you guys read Originals? Have you seen it? Adam Grant. He's a Wharton professor, youngest tenured Wharton professor of all time. Um, great guy. He actually wrote um, Option B with Sheryl Sandberg, and he wrote another one called uh, uh, Give and Take, which is about generosity. And so this is from his book. It says, entrepreneurs who kept their day jobs had 33% lower odds of failure than those who quit. This is a famous study that actually came out. Um, this is recently. And you can see that there's like this idea that entrepreneurs are kind of people who hedge a little more. And I, people who work for me and people who know me, like Jordan, will probably tell you that 
Again, I went to business school. I thought I came into Berkeley as an MCB major. I'm Asian, so obviously, MCB major. Uh, I thought I was gonna be a doctor, and then I really wanted to be a sportscaster. I thought I was gonna be an agent, like Jerry Maguire, which was a hot movie back then. And then I just didn't know what I wanted to do. I had like a messy period for about a year. But at the end of the day, I was always in person who hedged. I was always like, maybe this, maybe that. And I think that was a huge part of me being an entrepreneur because the next quote is that in the book originals, this is my favorite quote, I quote this almost all the time, is that people who move the world forward with original ideas are rarely paragons of conviction and commitment. The most successful originals are not daredevils who leap before they look. They are ones who reluctantly tiptoe to the edge of a cliff, calculate the rate of descent, triple check their parachutes, and set up a safe net at the bottom just in case. So I don't know, how many people relate to that? I don't know. Like, it's like half the room. So I would say, if, just because you relate to this doesn't mean, a lot of the time, 10 years ago, if I was in your guys' shoes, I totally would think I was not an entrepreneur. I'd be like, oh, I don't know, I don't think I have an enemy. I'm too conservative. Like, I, I just think I want everything to be overanalyzed and I need to make sure everything works. But as I, as I know a lot of the entrepreneurs in the Bay Area nowadays, like we all meet and we all talk, and I'm a food entrepreneur and I know all the tech entrepreneurs, and we all hang out, and we're all very similar. Like if you, I don't want to name drop, but like if you know any of these tech entrepreneurs, they're actually very conservative people. Read the book on uh, Originals. It talks about people, I have a very stable part of my life. For me, it's my family life. I've been married when I was pretty young. So I was married at 25, so I'm 35. That's 10 years of marriage, so I don't really have to worry about that part of my life. My risk is usually in other things. I'm actually like an adventure person. So I like doing crazy, like extreme stuff. Like I like parachuting or zip lining and that kind of stuff. And that's where I take my real risk. It's not boba guys that I take the risk, it's actually other parts of my life. So if you read the book Originals, it goes through this idea of having this mentality of what does it take to be an entrepreneur. They talk about Warby Parker. Um, and my favorite story, it's not in this book, but I am ex-Walmart. If you read my LinkedIn, my, one of my first jobs out of school was Walmart. And there's a story where Sam Walton, I know I'm in Berkeley, and I know Walmart's not like the favorite company out here, but um, when you learn about the Walmart story, is that Sam Walton took, I think, about $100,000 from his father-in-law. So think about how crazy of a risk that is. The, the risk isn't the money risk, it was social risk. So uh, it was every Christmas, if he's going home, his father-in-law is saying, hey, uh, how's everything, how's my money, how's the loan I gave you, and how are you treating my daughter? Like that's just the weirdest conversation if you think about it. And so to me, I think, Entrepreneurs are less about financial risk, less about you know making your life kind of crazy. It's more about social risk. And that's what I'm going to get into next, which is not everybody is built for entrepreneurship. I actually think the type of entrepreneurs that really thrive nowadays, uh, the ones that I know, the ones that are my peers, the ones that I see emerging, are a little more like, I'm just going to call it, they have zero fucks with you. So what I mean by that is this. It's like, when you think about these entrepreneurs, think of the Sam Walton example. Think of uh, the Google guys, Larry and Sergey. Think of Mark Zuckerberg. Think of like the guys you call Elon. It's not that they're, when they think about business, they're not like flying by the seat of their pants. They're very, very calculated. The business side is very calculated. But the social side of Elon, of Larry and Sergey, of even Jeff Bezos, if you read a lot of the early Amazon days, it's more that they actually didn't give a fuck about what people thought of them. It's very different from what the business side of things were. It was very obvious to Jeff Bezos that e-commerce e was going to be a big deal. It was very obvious that Larry, to Larry and Sergey that search was going to be the future, yet they were getting their PhDs in Stanford, right? For me, it was really, really obvious that a premium version of a drink that people in Asia, a billion people drink in Asia, and no, nobody drinks out here, I'm pretty sure we're gonna be able to artisanalize it, which is what my bet was. To me, it wasn't the business that was a crazy risk. It was me graduating Haas, and having, every time I come to alumni function, being, 
wow, you're in House McKinsey, how's Goldman, and then how'd you go Bobashaw? Like, if for me, I just had zero fucks. I don't really care that for three years I had two shops on the side and I looked really tired and I missed everybody's baby showers and birthday parties. For me, that was more of what defined me. So, at the end of kind of this little key, it's about making sure that are you that person that has a DNA that you really have zero fucks. So that's, I think, the core of the DNA. I rarely will meet an entrepreneur who cares a lot about what people think. I just rarely meet a successful one. It doesn't mean that they're socially awkward. It doesn't mean that they're like a jerk or a dick or anything like that. It just means when they hear what people say, they doesn't, they don't really, it doesn't register that they're going against the grain. And if you guys are a part of Haas, question the status quo is one of our defining principles, right? I don't know if you guys knew, but back then when I graduated, I was the first one to get the award in my class. They give out the Four Defining Principles Award. Dean Lyons, is he still our dean? No. Yeah. He is? He's this last semester, right? Or something. He gave that award. And I was, 2011, my year, and I got it. And in my generation, I kept on getting the award because, again, I was this lone boba, lone ranger guy. But uh, at the end of the day, it was because out of all the bankers and all the great Haas alumni, and there's a lot of amazing ones, I guess at the time, People saw that I was doing this really random thing. Uh, now it's been seven years. Uh, now they just want my money. <laughs> now it's like less of a random thing. Now they're like, oh my gosh, there is money in food. Um, so I think at the end of the day, what kept me there, the DNA was the, the zero fucks. And it doesn't mean that you're badass or anything like that. It doesn't mean if you are, don't have zero fucks and you have a fuck, it doesn't mean that you're like not going to be a great entrepreneur or anything like that. It's just that I think when you see the DNA of most entrepreneurs, there's like a certain thing missing. It's a little, they're wired differently. And that's where they just don't think of the social pressure the same way. So the second one, it's an easy one, I'm gonna breeze through this, is passion. And I think that's like super easy. Almost every entrepreneur, entrepreneur that I meet is really passionate about what they do. You rarely will meet, you know, uh, Someone who sells toothpaste or socks. I have a friend who started um, a company of MeUndies, right? So they sell underwear. How passionate do you have to be to actually sell a lot of fucking underwear? But, man, he kills it. I mean, the warehouse is nuts. So, like, at the end of the day, you're, you guys all know what, it's weird to talk about underwear, but you guys know what MeUndies is, right? I mean, they're super viral and, like, you know, super sexy and everything. But at the end of the day, they're selling underwear and nobody thought they were going to go into underwear business. He did. And I think you have to think about passion. I think for them, maybe the passion was, I want to build something really cool and have a lifestyle brand, right? For me, it's not like I grew up wanting to create a boba company. I, my passion, if you know me, my personal life, I'm really into sports. I'm really into maybe entertainment and pop culture. Boba and food is kind of like maybe a side hobby, but it's not my purest passion. So the myth that people say is that you can fake it until you make it. So people are like, you know what, I really like this idea. I'm really into like dating apps. I don't know, I'm like, I have all these friends who want to create dating apps. And I'm like, no offense, <clears throat> but the last thing you talk about is dating. You're a horrible, you're a, I hear you're a horrible date. And on top of that, like, you just don't even think correctly about, I think, the mechanics of dating. You're coming up with the next Tinder, the next Coffee Meets Bagel. You can't fake it till you make it. I'm a consumer behavior guy. My specialty is consumer behavior. I, most, I think most people can see through consumer behavior, false, like fake consumer behavior. I think you guys are all like, you're a millennial generation. You guys are supposed to be the wisest of the wisest. Why the hottest brands are all transparent, right? Millennials can see right through shit. That's where, I, I love millennials. I'm not, I'm like 35, so I'm like at the borderline. And the one thing you say about this entire generation, you can't generalize, but overall, you guys see right through everything because you guys grew up with social media. If somebody's trying to front and, and fake something, you'll be like, no, I've seen you know, your Insta stories and you're really, like, you're really not that cool. Like, I know the founder and the founder is as nerdy as you can get. How are they trying to you know, sell this like, really cool piece of like a shirt or something? So the fact that I kind of think it, it comes down to is that passion is the fuel that keeps you going when times get tough. Most consumers can see right through soulless mo uh, motives. Think about the hottest brands. What are the hottest brands nowadays? I don't know. Market research. What was your favorite brands like in college? Nike. Still Nike? 
Like, like Adidas, it's not as Adidas, man, with all the collabs, man. Like the Ed and D Pharrells, you got the 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 original originals. Any high piece in the room? Like uh, <laughs> no, too too poor for college. Yes, Patagonia. Patagonia, Patagonia is super hot. You can't get more passionate and transparent than Patagonia. Any any other ones? Supreme. Supreme. Oh, Supreme. I mean, owned by a private equity group now, but you can't get more passionate than that like line that wraps. A whole block, right? The Supreme. What else? Glossier. Like, uh, if you like your your boy brow, like you know, all, all four of the Glossier stickers and, and their their product, they line up for that. What else? The hottest brands are all passion brands nowadays. Nowadays, that's why all the brands that are closing are the ones that are soulless, the ones that have been around for a while and then nobody really fed into, right? What are the brands dying? The Glossier is taking over what? These soulless L'Oreal Lancome brands. Supreme has taken over pretty much Calvin Klein, all the, the youth used to wear giant CK sweatshirts and all that kind of stuff. And now Supreme is like every hip kid, every hype beast or hype day is wearing Supreme. Am I getting too like weird over my <laughs> um, But so it's all about passion, right? And you can see through it. You know, Kith, right? Like my favorite brand. You know, Ronnie and Kith or LeBron supporting Kith. It's real because that whole lifestyle, everything you do, the person who started it is himself. Boba Guys, like my, our mission at Boba Guys is the Bridge Cultures. I was an Asian kid that grew up in Jersey. My co-founder is an Asian guy who grew up in Texas, Wharton, Texas, 3,000 people, two Asians. This is his family, like two Asian families. And then, so when I talk about Boba Guys being a cross-cultural brand, you guys, I don't say buy it, but you guys understand, it's genuinely what I grew up with. I grew up around Italians and Hungarians, you know, like, and I, I'm used to trying to convince people what dumplings are. So I, when Boba came out, I was like, ah, I think I can do that. I can make it accessible without alienating Asian people at the same time without making like non-Asians feel like it's, it's a foreign thing for them. I can, I can interpret that. So with Ronnie at um, Supreme or everybody at Adidas or even Nike, they're able to figure out how you channel passion and you sell it authentically. That's a word that everybody's using nowadays, right? Authentic, authenticity, <clears throat> genuine, uh, transparency. All those things are all built around one word, and I think that's passion. So uh, it helps your business serve a higher purpose. So Boba Guys, I said our mission is pretty cool. <laughs> Patagonia, I don't you knew the slide, but it was about solving the environmental uh, crisis. You guys know how real a Patagonia is because why? What are, what are they doing right now? You guys know? Read the news? They're suing Donald Patagonia Trump. suing Donald Trump. I mean, that's not, honestly, it's a waste, <coughs> not a waste of money. It's using it for a point. But he's literally, I mean, Yvonne Chouinard, the founder and the executive team, is like, you know, I'm not going to get too much in politics. He's like, fuck you, Trump, essentially. He's like, you can't. You're suing them for taking away land. The government's taking away land. So you're suing them on the premise that the government, the land was ours, the public's, and then now they're taking it away. Mm -hmm. Patagonia didn't have to do that. But that passion serves right through. And it's their thing, right? Because environmentalism is the essence of what makes Patagonia Patagonia. So more and more of the brands are going into that. So when you start a brand, you have to really be passionate. This one I think you guys know too much about. So and then lastly, for us, the personal thing was that I, have a, I used to have a column on Huffington Post, and um, I wrote about this, you could read about it more, is that um, we almost shut down the business. So back in the day when I was doing this part time, uh, my co-founder and I thought maybe we'd shut this down because my career was still really hot. Um, and still, at the time I just thought I was going to be like this CMO of Pepsi or Coca-Cola. And so I was like, maybe it's not worth it, right? I'm going to make half a million dollars. And uh, I get to do branding, it's what I love to do. Uh, but at the time, I was like, no, but there's like the people. I, the title of the, the column I wrote that day was The Business Built by the People. And what that meant was it was uh, generally minorities across the United States who had read my column and said, why would you shut this down if you feel like you have a platform? And I didn't really, I really honestly didn't think I had a platform. It was like 2,000 people a week. I don't think that's a platform. But, I could see it could turn into something. This was five years ago. I forget when I wrote it. Like I think it was five years ago, 2012 or 13. And I think at the end of the day, it was passion that brought me back. 
Um, if you ask anybody in my team, including my sister who works for me, and Jesse, who's been with us for four years, and Ben, four years, four years, is that at the end of the day, like there was a lot of ups and downs. And for us to, to bootstrap this, there was a lot of times where only passion could carry us through. And I'll explain a little bit of that when I talk about the failure piece at the end. <coughs> Third one, people care. Everybody's like, oh, it's all about networking, especially in business school. I could not disagree with more, that more. Um, I always tell Ben and anybody who works for me, it's definitely networking and knowing good people is part of it, but it's more accurate to say it's about knowing the right people relevant for your business or what you want to do. So for me, it wasn't because I knew everybody in business school or I knew bankers or I knew people who had money. That didn't help me when I started Boba Guys. What really helped was that I actually had a lot of friends that owned food concepts. I just happened to be a foodie. And so uh, there was a concept actually in 2010 that was blowing up, and it was called Mission Chinese. If you know your food history, Mission Chinese was one of the hottest, it was the original, the OG of the pop-up. And the, one of the founders of Mission Chinese is a guy named Danny Bowie. Um, I remember Danny was experimenting, and him and Anthony, his, co his business partner, would, would say, hey, try this Andrew and Ben. And we'd go as, as kind of just fans of their food. And if it weren't for knowing them, we would never have had the idea of maybe doing our own pop-up, which eventually became a thing. And so this is just, I can go on and on about just knowing the right people, but I think you guys are really smart, and this is Haas in Berkeley. So you guys probably already know that you can spend all the time in the world, even this room, just doing, meeting entrepreneurs, uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur, meeting more entrepreneurs, meeting VCs. But at the end of the day, it's like, which VC? Which friend is going to help you do that? Are you going to meet your co-founder here? Those are the right type of networks that you want. Not just anybody with money or anybody who knows people who are other founders. So I don't want to belabor the point, because that's my co-founder right there. So we're like Mario and Luigi. Um, and so uh, I think Ben, you're in this one. Actually, actually both of you guys are in Right. Right. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. So we, we, so it was all about people relevant to your business. So, um, and then hopefully, you know, not to, can I just, you, Ben's situation was when he, can I say your story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ben's never thought about even applying to Haas at Berkeley. You wanted to go to SF State when you yeah. came in. I remember his interview to this day, and he came in, he's like, uh, I want to study Chinese, and I want to go to SF State. And you moved from Vermont, right? Yeah. And um, if you don't know, he's fluent in Mandarin. I was like, man, this kid's like, his, his, his IQ is like wicked. So I think he can do anything he wants. And I graduated here twice at the time. I was like, can you go to my alma mater? Like, I think Haas could use someone like you. But he's like, ah, I don't know, it's tough. And I was like, let me retrain kind of like the mentality. And over time, he obviously one of the fewest, few people who transferred into Haas, which is really hard to do. And I would say that a lot of that had to do with the network. Like, he trusted that. The one guy, and I, if you guys don't know, I, I called like administration. I'm like, I got one vote. I donate a shit ton of money to you. you this guy, you got to get at least get money. Um, and Jesse's that. She's trying to apply for business school. So I think at the end of the day, networking with the right people is what I think you need to do. That all goes back to what do you want to do, right? So that's why I'm asking. Are you going to start your toothpaste company or your political startup? Make sure that if you're a new political startup, you got to know then the ins and outs of politics. You do have to know a little of the basis for that. So the last one is shit ton of luck. And I think that's just where, you know, luck, it's, a lot of people think it's out of your control. Uh, and it's just not meant to be. I, I don't know. I think it's a very, like, fatalistic or a very passive view of life. Uh, I do think a lot of luck is involved, but I think it's much more of this, where you can improve your chances simply by setting yourself up for options. So here's what I mean by that. Uh, actually, there's a quote. My favorite quotes of all time is, it's a funny thing, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Um, it's Arnold Palmer, not the drink. He actually made the drink, but uh, uh, it's the golfer. He, he actually said that, and I love that quote because when people say, Andrew, like, can I make luck? I'm like, I don't know. I think you can. Because if anybody who knows, like Jordan who knows me, not as an employee, just know me just through other stuff, I would say I hit, I hit the ground all the time. I pound the pavement. So when I meet people and I need a phone call, like a landlord or a contact at a media company or like 
you know, can, can I get into this club or whatever. It's because I'm always around, I'm always present. And I think that's just a function of me being available, which is a lot of work. So what I would say is that a lot of my life in my career, and I hope it's you guys too, is like making sure that you have those opportunities. For me, it was like, I found the co-founder, my co-founder, over playing ping pong and football. <coughs> the luck part was that he was the only other Asian guy. It's very stereotypical, but uh, he was the only other Asian guy at a company called Timbuktu. They make these bags. Uh, um, I was a general manager at Timbuktu, and my co-founder, he's an Asian guy, but he actually was the creative director there. So Ben goes, hey, he knocks on my desk, and he says, hey, um, you want to play ping pong? I'm like, well, that's stereotypical, but sure, he does play. And so we, we played, and uh, over time, we played foosball, and you know, me saying yes, you know, at the time, I was like a GM, so I was like, man, I'm, I'm a little too senior for this. You know, my second day of work, do I need to play ping pong in front of everybody? You, because it's not like a, it's an open office. I said, yeah, why not? It's like 4 o'clock, let's, let's do it. Saying yes to those things really helped me get to know my co-founder, who eventually became now the co-founder of my company, right? The other one was a pop-up space through Ken Ken Ramen. People don't remember this or the little history. We have a book coming out, so... Um, so um, like I'm in the middle of like writing our origin story. And I was looking at these pictures and I was like, whoa, I forgot that our friends who had this ramen restaurant in the Mission District, which was right next to the Mission Chinese restaurant, we, we actually had no product. Yet our friends said, sure, let's, uh, let's host you. Like you can pop up in my bar. That's literally what it was. And all it was was actually one of the two founders was an ex-Google guy, and the other one was an ex-Cal guy. And I had the connection with the Cal guy, because he was a Cal guy, and alumni help each other, and he said, you know, you're smart, you'll figure it out. Like, he just trusted that we'd do it. But we had to go ask him. We had to be like, can we pop up in your unopened restaurant? We had to actually put ourselves out there. So a lot, I don't want to keep on going, a lot of the things that we did was just all about putting yourself out there. And I know you guys hear it all the time, but when I say it, 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 I see the difference. Like, if you talk to any of the alumni in our company, I'm like, if you want to get into, a lot of people want to get into business school or uh, become a nurse. I'm like, if you want to get into a nurse, you should meet all the doctors in the hospital or get on the radar of the admissions of the nurse committee right now. You just have to. Like, there's no way you're gonna like randomly be that resume that pops out of nowhere when they don't know your name. It's just nowadays impossible. So I always encourage anybody to really put their effort and create your own luck. Um, and then magic will happen. So um, so this is where I kind of want to end, where when I think about failure in entrepreneurship, and this is kind of the tough part, I actually don't think <coughs> failure in entrepreneurship is actually like a good good definition of anything. I think it comes down to your mindset at the end. And so failure to me is just one point in this continuum of success. So I mean, you've all heard the kind of Kobe version of this, right? If you guys know your sports. Like Kobe Bryant is very famous for like, I don't believe in failure. He says it like that. And he's like, no such thing as failure. And I'm like, wow, that's very bold. But I think what he's trying to say is that, you know, everything hopefully will end up on uh, a pathway to success. Failure is your one time where you maybe it looks like a dip because it doesn't feel good, but it's probably also a learning opportunity. For me, I have I'll share some huge learning opportunity for for me on ultimately what I for now is success. But who knows? Like I still may fail. And Boba guys, if it goes under, maybe that is hopefully another learned lesson where I go back into corporate. I don't know or. Starbucks hires me, I don't know what they want me. Like, there's probably a million things that can happen post failure, or you would call failure. But at the end of the day, I don't really see it that way. And it sounds super corny, like Kobe says it, but I really don't use failure. You can ask um, Ben or anybody who works for me. I, I actually say, I don't fail. I just never fail. And I, I work Berkeley, so all of us, I don't know how many Bs, I had like four Bs in my entire life. So I'm like, on top of that, I don't know what it feels like to actually not really get an A. But, but I also, in the times I got B's or the times I got rejected from grad school, I sadly didn't want to go to Stanford. I got rejected from Stanford. I felt, in a way, like a failure. But uh, sucks for them that I started Boba Guys out of Haas, so they don't get any of my alumni money. So, um, 
At the end of the day, like failing happens all, what you call failure happens all the time, but it's really just on this continuum. And then you usually break into areas of your weakest muscle, right? If you work out a lot, you're going to always see that like where you fail, where you break, is actually just going to make you stronger. And it's a stupid analogy that we always talk about, but it really is true. It's like when something doesn't work because maybe I was too emotional or I didn't analyze something hard enough or I trusted someone to buddy too much. That's where your muscle probably breaks. You probably had a weakness there. But by the time it heals back up, it's just a stronger muscle. You'll learn how to trust better. You'll learn how to analyze better. So I think at the end of the day, that's really what I think failure starts looking like. It's just a momentary break in this larger success story. So the part that I really want to talk about, which is kind of where I'll end in two minutes, is that failure is actually not really the topic. And this is me as not the founder or not a like a like a leader, not as a as a person who has been in the workforce for a really long time. Right? I'm 35, so I'm like 14 years out of, out, of, um, out of school. I think the word that people need to talk about is actually vulnerability. So I'm going to kind of give you my, my last thought on this. Vulnerability and, and failure are kind of related, but failure rolls up into vulnerability. The real goal that Haas should be teaching, and I've actually told Dean Lyons this. I said, uh, is Andrew, Andrew, Andre Marquis still the Lester Center guy? He used to be, right? Like I used to tell the head of Lester Center this, it's all about vulnerability. And if you guys read, there's an author, Brene, Br Brene Brown. If you guys read Brene Brown, you guys are not reading Brene Brown. You guys got to read Brene Brown. It's like Brene with a B, Brene Brown. And she talks a lot about this stuff. And it sounds super emo. And if you think it's emo, no offense, I actually think you guys are going to be backwards. You guys are probably going to have to catch up if you think it's emo. It is the future. Back in my generation, nobody barely talked about, um, people barely talked about emotional IQ. And people scoffed. Emotional IQ? No, it's about how smart you are. Little did we know that emotional IQ would be the thing a decade later with uh, Daniel Goleman. This generation, your generation, is all about vulnerability. It's about empathy, vulnerability. The reason is, think about what's going on today. All the leaders, all the kind of power structures, the power dynamics. It's about what? What's happening? Me too. <coughs> Time's up. It's about oppression, it's about minorities getting oppressed and all that kind of stuff. All of that is about the lack of awareness of what the oppressor is to the oppressed. All of it. There would be no me too if the people at the top knew what they were doing. They just have no idea. And coming out of a world in which vulnerability was not a thing, I could tell you for a fact, it's all crumbling down. All my friends who are in the banking world, who are the consultants at McKinsey, like I, if you guys don't know, I chose marketing, I chose Bain, I chose uh, marketing over Bain. I was, an ex I was supposed to be a consultant out of undergrad. And I remember that world and I said, I'm not, I'm just not like that. I'm not like too, I'm not that alpha douchey, I'm just not like that. And sorry, if you guys are going to Bain or McKinsey or BCG. But I, I just, I, you can tell I'm a little softer. And now I'm like, yeah, like the emo kids have their moment. But I, at the end of the day, I really think it is the case. I think vulnerability, you don't have to be like soft. I'm not saying be a snowflake. But I am saying that you guys really need to figure out, all right, when I'm leading somebody, how am I going to show them that it's OK to look weak, look weak, right? So I'll tell you a couple examples of this, right? For vulnerability, number one was I had an anxiety attack maybe four years ago. Nobody likes to talk about mental health. If you're Asian, you know there's stigma <coughs> around mental health, right? And I had an anxiety attack. I was in Clorox. I remember calling uh, at my desk. I was calling Kaiser. I was like, uh, it's like a weird hotline. I don't know they had a hotline. They have a, apparently have a hotline. And I said, hey, um, I can't feel my left arm. I think I have a heart attack. Um, I thought I slept on it wrong, but it's not. And I'm telling them the diagnosis, like what were my symptoms. And they're like, I think you have an anxiety attack. Where the person, the lady on the phone said that. And I was like, you should go check in, but if you're OK, like, just calm down. <coughs> I don't know, and I was really freaking out because I actually thought it was a heart attack. And then I went home, and then my wife was like, grow up, and then, uh, <laughs> but at the end of the day, I was like, man, what happened? Because in my life, I always thought I had it put together. I was the guy who graduated, you know, like out of Cal, I, you know, went up in three majors, I was top of my class, high honors, got every job I wanted, all that kind of stuff. I, sold my, I actually sold my first company before grad school, right? So. I had a tech company I sold um, when I was 28. So I, not to be like, that's what happened. 
So I'm 30 and I'm having an anxiety attack. I'm like, what? What the fuck is going on? And so I really felt like a failure going home. Even at work, I think I actually left work early that day. I was like calling at 3.30 p.m. And like by 4.30, I just, I wasn't getting fixed. So I was like, hey, my boss, like, hey, I have to go home early. I don't feel good. And I didn't tell her. Actually, to this day, I don't think I told her that it was an anxiety attack. So that, to me, was a massive failure because I thought I could handle something as heavy as that. Um, another one would be, last time I really cried, first time I actually really cried about a job. Um, I have no qualms about crying. I watch a lot of This Is Us, so if you watch that, like, make you cry all the time. But the idea was we went after a Series A. So they actually know this whole story. Where Boba Guys um, was offered a massive Series A round. We would have been the first truly funded, Series A funded, Boba shop in the world. I don't think it's ever existed. To this day, I don't think it's happened. The group was a really reputable brands that you guys all know. Um, and it would have shot us in the stratosphere. I had people lined up. We had it was already past the term sheet. I'm about a week away from getting $2 million, $2 million into my bank account. We had a $10 million valuation. And so I'm about to lose a quarter, a fifth of the company, right? And uh, I think I made you guys vote, right? Yeah. I said, all shift leads in the company, you vote whether to take money or not. And were you there too? Yep. Yeah. We're at the Metreon. We're at the Metreon. Yeah, exactly. I said, the court. yeah. <laughs> so there was 14 votes, and it was, I'm oh, sorry, 15 votes, and 14 out of 15 said, take the money. One, one guy, Kalen, is the one that, who, uh, purist, I love him, but he said, no, <laughs> don't, don't take the money, be independent. So we ended up saying yes, we took the signed term sheet, and what happened was they, um, uh, 11th hour, like this is a week before, the diligence is already done, it's, it's just pure legal, it's like the lawyers talking, and they say, hey, you really want to go to New York, right? And I said, yeah, that's the plan, I'm about to fly to New York actually in a week. And they said, I don't think you should open in New York. I'm like, ah, oh, that was discussed for like six months now, that we've been, we're about to go to New York. Do you not trust me? What's going on? And a long story <clears> short, it was what about trust. They didn't trust that we would be able to do it. If you guys don't know, we have three stores in New York now. But uh, at the time, they, we didn't even open one yet. And they, uh, the partner, one of the partners said, then if you go to New York, we're out. I said, that doesn't happen. And I'm like, I called this bluff. That doesn't happen. I'm like, we're going to New York. And he goes, no, we're out. And it ended up, I'm trying to speed through this process. Like, it was like an hour conversation. At the end, he just walks out. One of the partners of this firm just literally walks out in the middle of the room. To this day, they know. I haven't seen this person in person. And he was my mentor. And I was like, what? I was like, what the fuck? Like, what really happened here? Because, you know, this is like, you know, social network stuff, right? You're like, wow, you're about to, like, slam this book and break Mark Zuckerberg's court, uh, keyboard. So, you're like, what's going on in this moment? I look at my partner, and I'm like, uh, I think he's, like, playing a game or what? We walk out, and within 48 hours, the deal broke. Like, $2 million, didn't get wired. The three people I said were going to join the team, they basically called him up and, like, we didn't have no money. We didn't get the money. And it broke my heart. It was so much that I, I, I cried. Like, it, I was just, like, I, I just, like, two days, I just did not work. And I felt broken because I'm, like, because I was hurt. Because it basically, I took it, took it as... They didn't trust me with their money. It's really what it comes down to, right? When a venture capital company does not give you money, it's just because they don't trust you with their money. And I was offended, and it sucked, and I was vulnerable. It was weird telling them, uh, yeah, they're, we're not getting the money. And then I forget, I had to go to New York, right? And I came back and I told you on that trip back what happened. And they're like, ah, uh, there's no money. And it was the most awkward conversation, and I felt naked, and I think, there's millions of moments like that where I felt like I could have probably pretended and did everything like buttoned up, but I, I just couldn't. So I wanted to leave you guys with, if you guys are like Haas alumni one day, or not Haas, a Berkeley alumni, and, and just really gonna kind of conquer the world, the one thing I really want you guys to lead with is not like the Gordon Gecko type that you guys know, Wolf of Wall Street. I know it's really appealing, I know it's really sexy, I have a lot of friends in that world. Please be more of the, the Brene Brown, the, 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 the emo softer type. I do think that is the archetype of the future leader, not just entrepreneur, but executives. And you, because you don't want to get me too. <laughs> so like, like, you can't be that douche who's gonna like be so unaware and everything is like top down and no emotions. You have to be very aware of what's going on. And the vulnerability, I think, is the key to everything. So.
I have five minutes for questions if you guys uh, have any. Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. Question. This is more for the marketing people in the room. Uh, who wants to do marketing? Pure marketing. Uh, I, I always guess you know, entrepreneurs and marketing overlap a lot. So about a third, right? So high level answer. Experience to me, when you buy a product, they always in marketing speak. You have the utility, the, the utility of a product. It's what the product does. I'm drinking this for sustenance. It gives me calories, and therefore my body works. That's milk tea. Is I'm thirsty. I want to drink this. But beyond that is when you walk into a boba guys, to somebody else who sees you drinking boba, it was like, wow, I'm just gonna be a little provocative here. I'm like, dude, he's a white dude, and he's drinking boba. That's awesome. Like, you, then that, that white dude's like, wow, I got to be credit with agents. You know, <laughs> I think it's more of that. Another one would be, wow, you're drinking, um, you're drinking boba guys versus quickly. There's a three to two to two to three dollar price difference because we use organic milks, we source our own stuff, and then you're like, well, that person knows his quality. It's like somebody who's wearing Supreme versus somebody who's wearing Gap. The people in the know know there's a difference between Supreme and Gap. Nothing wrong. There's pe Gap people can choose Gap. We all know Supreme people are gonna look down at people who wear Gap. So like, <laughs> we know that's how it works. So it's all about experience. It's why people pay more. It's about the line for Boba guys. It's about education. It's about the ethos. It's about we have a lot of apparel. We sell an abnormal amount of apparel for Boba guys. We have this shirt called Boba Bay that kind of like we, we own this IP. And it, uh, it helps us kind of further the lifestyle. The other one is we sponsor a lot of like influential events like book tours, book signings, concerts, which no Boba shop would ever spend. It's not good ROI. But we do it because it enhances the idea that boba is truly for everyone. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, like speaking of branding, I feel like your like lifestyle brand is the defining factor that like sets boba guys apart. And like at the store, like the menu felt more like a lookbook for like a high fashion. Like yeah, yeah. yeah, like like it, it felt like 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 higher class. And so I was wondering, like, how do you go about building that like? defining brand that really sets you apart because that I feel like that has really like made your business rather than break it and like also like where does the anteater come from and like what is all that like about? Cool. Alright, anteater is an easy question. That's just kind of our spirit animal. When we built the brand, we knew all the boba shops. This is 2010-11, remember. They were all cutesy, all cartoony. So we wanted something that was a lot more like timeless and classic. So we thought if we're an animal, which one would it be? At the time, Honey Badger was going out like super viral, like you know the video Honey Badger and Give a Shit or something. <laughs> like we thought we were that, but it, when you draw the Honey Badger, it looks kind of like a skunk. So it just didn't work. So like nobody wants to drink food from a skunk. Um, so uh, it's kind of like the, why the anteater. But I think at the end of the day, when you're talking about um, what, what's your exact question about the the, the experience? Like, how did you go about building that brand? And oh, like, building the whole brand? lifestyle yeah. brand around, like, so Boba. So, when you build the lifestyle, for us, lifestyle, this is, who was into, like, fashion? Like, that's kind of, like, the world I live in. Okay. If you're really into fashion, our friends run, like, Everlane, um, Kuyana, she was my class. Um, if you like Kuyana, uh, Carol from Opening Ceremony, um, all these amazing kind of, like, uh, fashion heads. When you think about fashion, I would say it's probably the best way of talking about lifestyle because it's a true commodity. You can make those shirts, you can make it anywhere. What creates it? And I think when you create lifestyle, it's about experience. Sadly, the word I'm going to use just to run with it is exclusivity. You want to be able to say they have it and you don't. And then you create value there. Uh, the definition of marketing, if you take a branding class, is always the creation of value between a client and customer. It's creation of value, right? So if you think about it, like you're buying something, a shirt in fashion that is probably roughly the same cost, but because it has the brand Prada, Gucci, or Supreme on it, you can upcharge a lot. Stone Island right now, it's like all about Stone Island. So like when you have that premium, what is actually warranting that $100 premium or 80% premium? A lot of that is, well, if 
not everybody can get it. Or when you wear it, you're in the know. Or because you're wearing it, uh, if you know Maison Cucine, which is a great brand, they throw these uh, parties. They throw, uh, they have like music. They have a music label. So in order to be a part of the Maison Kutsune crew, you go to the Maison Kutsune parties in a Soho hotel. And that, that ROI on this specific party sucks ass. $40,000 to throw a party. 1,000 people that go there. Half of them are models. And the other ones are douchebags. <laughs> like, 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 those are the people who go to that party. But you know what? When you're at Maison Kutsune and you're wearing it, you feel like, wow, that's, a, that's worth $150 a sweatshirt. Because you know how hard it is to get that. And it's part of that vibe. It's part of like, it's why kids, it's like 200 bucks. So you create the ethos around something. It's why, um, why do people want to go to Berkeley, right? Like that's a lifestyle brand. Why did you, you guys choose Berkeley Cal versus USC? A lot of you guys, actually that's your choice between you know, University of Spoiled Children and uh, the best public university in the world. Like, I get that. And for you, it's lifestyle. It's when somebody sees a Berkeley shirt, they're like, this person went through, it's a public school. So they're a little more school of hard knocks. I get it, you know? Whereas like, oh, that's cool. Like, you drive your Audi. Like, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's a difference between a Cal and a US. I have a lot of USC friends, right? So like, and Stanford kids too. Oh, Stanford's almost, I know, some people say different tier, but like, some people are saying like UCLA and USC is probably the best example. And there's a difference. So I think that's also about lifestyle. It's about the ecosystem. Like one, USC has great alumni network, and that's why they're so proud of it. And then uh, they have great parties around it. And then Cal is like, you're like near you have all the Nobel Prize winners, and when there's a Democrat in office, it's all of Berkeley's professors, right? So like you get to say that, you have that exclusivity, that bragging right. That's still part of this lifestyle ecosystem. So, that is all the time we have. Oh, yeah, okay. Thank, thank if you, you have any questions, please email Andrew over guys. Thank you for your time. And if you guys want to have some personal questions, I mean, individual questions, you'll stay for a few minutes outside. Personal questions. I think.